Hello again and welcome back to our course on MTA Database Fundamentals, exam 98-364. In this section we're going to look at database security concepts. Let's start by taking a look at the objectives for this section. First of all, to understand the need to secure a database. Secondly, to understand what objects can be secured and what objects should be secured, and then understanding user accounts and roles. Let's look now at some basic security principles. First of all, development of a security plan should occur early in the development of a database. Secondly, security must be carefully designed, implemented and tested. The security plan will depend heavily on the size and nature of the database and on its business requirements. Consider these two very different scenarios. In the first case we have a small database containing information that is not confidential and is to be accessed by three or four users. In this case the three or four users may each be able to do pretty much anything they want to the database and they have no confidentiality either from each other or from the outside world and therefore there's no particular reason to protect anything in the database. In the second scenario we have a large database containing financial data that is to be maintained by a professional team and made available to the general public. In this case, what the professional team who are maintaining the database can do and what members of the general public can do are very likely to be very different things. Now when we're talking about security in general in relation to databases, we have the concept of securables, things that can be secured and different objects, the databases themselves, the tables in the database, the logins, the users, different roles, all of the kinds of objects that we're going to talk about in this section can be granted permissions to access these different securables. In that first scenario we may well say that every object can access everything. In the second scenario we need a very careful plan, a very careful mapping from the objects to the securables in terms of who or what can access what. Now in order to demonstrate these general security principles I'm going to use a very straightforward simplified security model. And this security model works simply on the principle going from left to right that a user can log into a database server and then via the master database which keeps information basically about who can access which databases a user is given an ID and is allowed to access certain user databases. What they're allowed to do in those user databases is governed by their roles that they may have and by specific permissions that they may have. Alongside this and optionally there may be guests with access to user databases and guests generally will have very limited access, they will have very limited permissions on the database and in fact guest users may not be allowed at all. But this is the very simplified security model that we're going to use. Now the first step in our security model is server level security. This is where the user gets access first of all to the server. Users get access to the server via one of three methods. Either via a Windows user login or by a membership of a Windows user group or by a SQL Server specific login. This third case is only available if SQL Server is using mixed mode security. Now I'm going to talk some more about that a little bit later on. A login is controlled by a user's credentials which are often just a username and password. Once logged in users are known at the server level by their login either their SQL Server login if we're using a SQL Server specific login or by their Windows login and once a user is logged in 
his or her rights are determined by their server roles. Now it's important that you're familiar with these fixed server roles and this table shows you the fixed server roles. Unfortunately, you pretty much need to know these. The most important one is the one right at the top, sysadmin. Because a sysadmin can perform any activity in the server at all, and that means sysadmin can do all sorts of dangerous things, including granting other users rights to do anything. And they can map any network login ID to a specific database user ID. So that means the sysadmin really can do just about anything. A user may belong to multiple roles. Let's just take a quick look at these roles. A server admin can change server-wide configuration options and shut down the server. Security admin can manage logins and their properties. They can grant, deny and revoke server level permissions. They can also grant, deny and revoke database level permissions if they have access to a database. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on as well. And they can reset passwords for SQL Server logins. Process Admin can end processes that are running in an instance of SQL Server. Setup Admin can add and remove linked servers by using Transact SQL statements. Bulk Admin can run the Bulk Insert statement which enables bulk insert of data. Disk Admin can manage disk files and DB Creator can create, alter, drop and restore any database. So they are the fixed server roles. Now in addition there are some other roles that you need to be aware of. One of them is the public role which is another fixed role but it can have object permissions like a standard role. We'll talk about object permissions later as well. Every user is automatically a member of the public role and cannot be removed from the public role. And for most users when they log in that's the role that they get. So they don't get things like sysadmin or setup admin, they get the public role. And it is in effect a baseline level of permission for users. You cannot modify the permissions assigned to a fixed server role. For this reason it is possible to establish user defined roles with very specific sets of permissions to avoid assigning a fixed server role that may have more permissions than a user needs. And particularly in a large and sophisticated database where the security model is pretty complicated you may need to establish user defined roles so that people only have the permissions that they need. So the user has logged in and they will have a server role or roles. Whether they can use a Windows login or a SQL Server login will be determined by the authentication mode that has been set up. And this is set up when SQL Server is installed. Windows authentication mode will only allow Windows authentication so they'll log in via the Windows login. In mixed mode then both Windows authentication and SQL Server user authentication are allowed. But which authentication mode is in use is set up when SQL Server is installed although it can be changed. SQL Server uses a two-phase authentication scheme. So once the user has been authenticated in the appropriate mode, access can be granted to individual databases. And SQL Server stores login information within its master database. Now in the case of Windows authentication, obviously Windows users are created and managed using tools that are dependent on the version of Windows that is in use. So if you needed to set up a Windows user, that is a Windows function. Once a user exists in Windows, they can then be recognized by SQL Server. Within SQL Server, Users can be managed using either the logins option within SSMS or using T-SQL commands. Let's take a quick look at the dialog for creating a new login.
Bearing in mind that SSMS can also be used for other administrative functions such as removing a Windows login. Note that when we talk about removing and creating new logins, we're not actually creating or deleting the Windows accounts. We're just making them recognized or not recognized by SQL Server. Now there's a very important point to note here. I've connected to my installation of SQL Server. We're looking at logins. Logins are unrelated to a specific database. At this point, we haven't tried to get access to a database yet. We're not talking yet about doing something to or in a database. We're talking about access to the SQL Server installation itself, access to the server. So we look under security and within security we look at logins and if I expanded logins you could see all of the users that have logins to my installation of SQL Server. If I wanted to create a new login right click click on new login and I get login new. Now that login new dialog lets me set up a login name to choose between Windows Authentication and SQL Server Authentication. I should point out that we're not going through all this so that you can actually do it. It's just the concept of what you can do here. And you can also do things like select the server roles. Now as you can see by default the new login here gets the public role. If I wanted to give this person some of the other roles, I could. And in fact, with the login that I'm logged in under, I can do anything. I'm effectively sysadmin on this. So that's how we would set up a new login. Also, if I wanted to delete a login, I could right click on it and I could actually remove that login. Now, apart from using the SSMS GUI interface, to create and delete Windows logins, I can also set up Windows authentication using tSQL commands. So to add a new Windows user or group, I can use the create login command like this, create login, and then the name of the existing Windows user or group. Now bear in mind that here I've got a Windows domain, so it's on Windows domain, Acme domain, and the user is Johnson B. If I wanted to remove a Windows user or group, I would use drop login, something like this. Now let's just briefly return to that login new dialog again. Notice that apart from the Windows authentication option, the SQL Server authentication option is there. If I choose that option, then the user will actually be set up as a SQL Server user. So I'm going to need to give that user a password and I'm going to need to set some options related to passwords and so on. And in fact, when I set up a new login in either case, there are some other options down here just to be aware of, such as the default database for that user. Now for SQL Server users, you have two options again. You can either do administration using the SSMS GUI in a similar way to Windows users, as I just pointed out. Or, of course, you can use tSQL commands. So to add a new SQL Server user, you would use a create login command. So, for example, create login Smith A. The thing to note, of course, is when you're setting up a new SQL Server user, you'll need to set up additional information, as I pointed out just now. And there is an alter login command. And with alter login, you can set up or modify all of the various properties that you might need to set for a SQL Server user. So, for example, if you wanted to set the default database, one of the things I pointed out just now, having created the login Smith A, you could alter login Smith A with default database is one of the options equals parts DB. Now, if you search for create login and alter login within the Microsoft.com site and look within MSDN or TechNet, you will see all of the options that are available with those create login and alter login commands. Now let's go back to our simplified security model again.
We've managed to get as far as the server now. We've logged in. We have access to the server. We've got our server roles. The next thing we need to do is to be able to get into a database. So we need to look at database security next. Once a user has gained access to the server, access may be granted to individual user databases. Users are generally granted access to a specific database by adding them to the database, so the list of users for the database. And a guest database user can be set up for users without their own access. So let's now turn our attention back to SSMS and have a look at users within a specific database. Now what happens within the server and what the person who is doing administration on the server does for each user. Let's choose this user here. If I right click on that user and look at that user's properties, I'll see that the pages of properties include a user mapping page. And that user mapping page lets me choose which databases that user can access. So this user can access those two databases. Now within those databases I can also say what that user's username is. Now in this particular case that user owns those databases so their username is DBO. But if I wanted to log them in with just a different username in any case I could. Now within one of those databases and let's go to PartsDB Within the PartsDB database there is a security folder. Within that security folder there is a list of users and one of the users is DBO which is the name, the mapped name given to that Windows user when they're working within this database. Now again if I wanted to add a new user I could right click on users, click on new user a database user new comes up. I can put in a username. I can choose the login name for the person who is going to correspond to this username. And then I can assign to them database roles. And I'm going to talk about database roles in just a moment. The other thing I'm going to talk about in just a couple of minutes time is securables and you remember I mentioned securables earlier on and this is where I specify which of the securables within the database they have access to and what sort of access they have so I can actually say what they can insert, what they can select, what they can delete and so on. Now again we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes time. But for the moment, that is one of the ways that I can add a user to a database. And I've also shown you there how I can map the login to the username within the database. So when it comes to granting access to a database, as we've seen, it can be done using the SSMS GUI. It can also be done by issuing a T-SQL command from within the database. It has to be done from within the database itself. And it would be create user and then you use the login name, that's a Windows login name in that particular case, and then the username for the user within the database. That would set up the user with Windows login that as database user Tom B. Note also if you want to drop that user to remove that user's access to the database, you would use drop user Tom B. Now I mentioned just now database roles. Let's look at the fixed database roles. There are again quite a few of them and again you pretty much need to know what these are. DB owner can perform all configuration and maintenance activities on the database and can also drop the database. DB Security Admin can modify role membership and manage permissions. Adding principles to this role could enable unintended privilege escalation. So you've got to be careful who has that role because it can easily escalate so that people get that role that you don't want to have that role. 
DB Access Admin can add or remove access to the database for Windows Logins, Windows Groups and SQL Server Logins. DB Backup Operator can back up the database. DB DDL Admin can run any DDL command in a database. DB Data Writer can add, delete or change data in all user tables. DB Data Reader can read all data from all user tables. DB Deny Data Writer cannot add, modify or delete any data in the user tables within a database. And DB underscore Deny Data Reader cannot read any data in the user tables within a database. So you need to know those. And now we need to turn our attention to object ownership and security. A critical aspect of security in SQL Server is ownership. Objects include tables, views, store procedures and columns. Every object is contained within a schema and a schema is owned and everything within the schema has the same owner. If a user has access to a database that doesn't actually give them permissions by default. What they get will depend on membership of roles, but they can also be granted permissions on an individual basis. So if a user has access to a database, they may be granted permissions to individual database objects. Permission may be granted directly to the user or by assigning the permission to the role and assigning the user to the role. This is the preferred approach to security in relation to object permissions. Also note that users may be assigned to multiple roles, so there may be multiple permission paths. Working out what permissions a user has can be quite complicated, particularly if the user has multiple roles, and particularly if, in a particular database, permissions are complicated anyway. Now before I go into object permissions in a bit more detail, I'd just like to show you something very quickly in SSMS. I'm in the parts database and if I expand tables and look at the parts table and look at the properties of the parts table, notice that one of the pages in the table properties is permissions. Now I'm not going to do this now, but basically if I want to assign permissions to either users or roles on an object such as a table, and bear in mind that I can assign permissions on other objects such as columns or store procedures, then there is usually a dialogue like this one where you can assign those permissions in a very flexible and powerful way. Now I'm not going to go through that here in SSMS. You don't need to be able to do that. You only really need to understand the basic principles. And we're going to look at that now and a couple of examples using T-SQL commands. So let's look then at object permissions. Object permissions are assigned by means of grant, revoke and deny. Revoke removes the permission assigned. Deny overrules grant. And don't forget a user may have multiple permission paths to an object. Now the rule to remember is that deny always rules. So if there are five permission paths to a particular object for a user and four of them grant access and one denies, then access is denied. Deny always overrules grant. Permissions can be administered using SSMS or T-SQL commands. Now the basic object permissions are these. Select is the right to select data and select permission can be applied to specific columns. Insert is the right to insert data. Update is the right to modify existing data. Update rights for which a WHERE clause is used do require those select rights as well. And update permissions can be set on specific columns in a table. Delete is the right to delete existing data. DRI is the right to create foreign keys with DRI.
and execute is the right to execute store procedures or user defined functions. And if you're wondering what DRI is, it's Declarative Referential Integrity. So let's look at some examples of granting object permission using T-SQL commands. Grant select on parts to Tom B would give the user Tom B the permission to select on the parts table. You can grant more than one permission to more than one user at the same time. So for instance, you could say grant both insert and delete on the customers table to Jane C and Tom B. And also there are various additional clauses. You might want to look at grant and deny and revoke in MSDN or TechNet to see all the various options, but this is an important one. Grant delete on orders to Jane C. So Jane C has the permission to delete from the orders table. With grant option means that not only that, but Jane C can pass this permission on to somebody else. Revoke all on parts to Tom B says whatever permissions have been given to Tom B on the parts table are to be revoked. Now note that is not the same as saying that Tom B has permissions denied. It just means that anything that's been said about permissions for him on the parts table is revoked. And the final example, deny select on customers to Carl D. So Carl D cannot select from the customers table. So that's it, just a quick review of the objectives, understanding the need to secure a database, understanding what objects can be secured, understanding what objects should be secured, understanding user accounts, and understanding roles. That's the end of this section. Please join me for the next one.